Hello, friends, and welcome back to r slash pro revenge. Let's start with a story in which a friendly woman turned into a Karen in seconds. But before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you're new here and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video every single day. Here we go. It's sad when kids have to explain the law to their parents. I was working the customer service counter at work, and this woman, total non-Karen type, friendly joking with me, and three teenagers, T1, T2, T3 come up, she wanted to buy some cigarettes. No problem. So she looks at her phone and reads it out. Again, not that uncommon. Canada recently changed the packaging requirements for every brand. They all look identical now, so you need to know the exact name. After years and years of just having to worry about the color and brand, it's taking some getting used to even a year and a half later. It's a reflex. So some people, especially people that only smoke occasionally, have the name of their preferred cigarettes saved in their phones. Anyway, she lists off the brand, size, etc., all the info I need, and as I'm heading to the correct drawer, I hear the words that make me stop dead. I don't know. I don't smoke. Then this exchange ensues when she transforms into Karen before my very eyes. Me. I'm sorry, I can't sell them to you. I would need to ID the person they're for. K. Are you serious? They're for my girlfriend. She's having a rough day. I said I would pick up some smokes for her. I'm sorry, but once I ask for ID, I need to see it. And once I know they're not for the purchaser, I need to see the ID for the one they are for. Even if I go to another store? I have no control over other stores. I just cannot legally sell them to you now that I know they're not for you. This is effing ridiculous. She's 36 years old. Teenager 1, Mom, it's the law. She can't sell them to you because she has no proof that they're not for someone under 19. For all she knows, you could be buying them for one of us. Fine, we'll go somewhere else. It's all stupid. I could hear all of what he was saying to her after, but before they were out of earshot, he was still trying to explain that it was the law and that I was only doing my job. Not five minutes later, a gentleman came in asking for the exact same cigarettes he was paying cash. I have zero doubts that he was her husband, but I can't prove that. He didn't say that they were for anyone else. He was polite, paid, and went on his way. Just for clarification, there are some brands that we sell a lot of, some that we hardly sell at all, and some that land somewhere in the middle. This was one of the middle brands, common enough that they could have plausibly been for the gentleman that bought them, but uncommon enough that I would have bet money that he was Karen's husband. And our next story. How much is your time really worth? I used to work for a cell phone company back in the bad old days before iPhones and Android when BlackBerry ruled the land and you had a limited number of minutes and texts. At the time, customers with Palm or BlackBerry devices got unlimited data for $30 a month on top of whatever calling and texting plan they had. One day, there was a massive DOS attack on BlackBerry servers, and since BlackBerry OS was set up to run everything through their servers, that meant that all BlackBerry users had no data service for about two hours. I get a call from a customer with a thick, hybrid New York, New Jersey accent. She's calling to complain about the outage, which was now fixed. She claimed she'd lost thousands of dollars because she couldn't use her BlackBerry Messenger or her email. Now, this is such a common claim that it quickly becomes like background noise to anyone working at a cell company. If you can really lose hundreds or even thousands of dollars from an outage, you can afford multiple phones on every carrier in case one or more goes down. Therefore, anyone claiming an outage cost them tons of money is either a liar or an idiot. Either way, it was a surefire way to get zero sympathy from a tech support rep. I explained that the outage was due to a hacking attack on BlackBerry and verified that, yes, her calls and texts, the only thing that didn't go through BB, had worked perfectly all day. I tried to explain how BB handled all data from its devices and why, security, but she was having none of it and demanded compensation for her lost time. Me is me, EW is entitled woman. EW, I lost a lot of money because of your outage. I want a credit. Me, oh well, it is our policy to provide a credit for, good, then do it. Well, I need to go over, I don't care, give me the credit, but do it. Okay, brief pause. Okay, a credit of nine cents has been applied to your next bill. Is there anything else I can help you with? What? Nine cents? Yes, ma'am. Why only nine cents? 
Well, as I tried to explain, I can provide a credit for the amount of time the service was out. You pay $30 a month for unlimited data. Even though this month has 31 days, I rounded it off to 30, so $1 per day. Since the service was out for two hours, that's one twelfth of the day, and one twelfth of $1 is 8.3333333 cents, which I rounded up to nine for you. That is ridiculous. I need more than that. Ah, uh, well, as I tried to tell you before, once I've applied a credit for the downtime, I can't provide any others without a manager's approval. Then give me a manager! Of course, ma'am. I do need to let you know that if you speak to a manager, any deals or credits I've offered can be rescinded by the manager. Whatever, get one! Five minutes of hold time later, I get one of our escalations managers on the line and explain the situation. After a long pause, during which I hear her typing, the EM speaks. I can offer her eight cents. Me, grinning, I already gave her nine because I rounded up. Well, now she's only getting eight. Put her on the line. I never loved a coworker as much as I loved that EM in that moment. And our last story, Greasy Landlord Gets His. I needed a place to stay and didn't have much of a choice in the matter. The price and location were right, so I had to rent from this slumlord the landlord. He's a self-proclaimed handyman. He drove a gutted out crap ball of a van filled with cheeseburger wrappers and junk, acted less than interested in any of my problems as a tenant. I went through three fridges, used ones, not new of course, hundreds in groceries, lost a bunch of clothing and furniture when the house flooded twice in one week. There was a faint but constant smell of natural gas. The furnace only worked when you lit the pilot light, which you had to do every time you wanted heat in the winter and half a effing tree that landed on the roof during a storm, but was never removed. Me. Minnesotan tend to be too GD nice at times. Always, always, always pay my rent on time, took care of all the utilities and general upkeep, mowed, shoveled, cleaned the lawn, etc., etc., of the property during my tenancy. Good tenant. I have too many stories about this cat, but I'll get to the revenge part of this. I'd finally had enough, and I had decided to move out of this slum, I'd lost thousands of my own money to use on the upkeep of the property since the landlord had no intention on helping me ever. I'd found a new place and had told my landlord the news when I handed him a check for a month and a half and told him that I would be moving out in a set number of days. We agreed and it seemed to go quite well. This is when all this crap really started running downhill. He showed up in my apartment one day unannounced and was looking for something. To this day, I don't know what, but I confronted him and he ran out of my apartment like he'd been caught snooping in a woman's panty drawer. Then, when I'm at work, he starts leaving me this really creepy messages saying I didn't pay him rent and that I've been destroying the property. I brushed it off, take a few days off work, and move out of my place after I call my new landlord explaining my dilemma. My new landlord agrees to let me move in early free of charge. Awesome. I move out and get a couple of friends to help me deep clean the place. It's amazing what you can buy with a case of beer and some pizza. We clean the place and it's spotless. After we finish, I get this weird feeling and I take pictures. Tons and tons of pictures of every room. Feeling content, we pack up the rest, lock the doors and leave. We had a good night and I bought pizza and beer for my friends that came out to help. A couple days go by and Slumlord Larry calls and asks where I went. I explained that I really wanted to move and I worked out a situation with my new landlord that would allow me to move in early. He started shouting at me on the phone, going off about how I still owe him rent money and I couldn't terminate my lease, which there was no such thing, by the way, just a verbal agreement and the exchange of money. I had enough of his business, and I hung up. A month goes by, I hear nothing from the slumlord. Then all of a sudden, I get a certified letter from him in the mail, along with some pictures. How in the F did he get my new address, I think to myself. I open the letter, and dude is going to try to effing sue me, stating that I damaged his property with supposed pictorial evidence and for the need sum of five thousand dollars it would all go away and we would not need to take it to court i say f this call up my parents and get the number for their lawyer i explain everything to him and tell him about the pictures i saved i ask my lawyer if there's anything that i could do about this i'm steaming and i want blood my lawyer laughed it off and told me to go check and see if the property was listed under a rental property in the city that i lived in The next day, I go down to the government center and find out that the slumlord does not have it listed as anything other than residential. 
I turn them in, and I also find out that the property cannot be rented and a permit for someone to even come look at the property to make sure it was up to code in the county I lived in was $5,000. Jubilant would not even begin to describe my mood at this time. I was white guy celebrating the B out of the lobby. I call my lawyer as I'm leaving the government center and tell him the good news. As I'm leaving town, I decide to drive past my place and see if anyone's living there. As I pass, I can't believe my effing eyeballs. I see the slumlord and a buddy of his, Toothless Dave, outside the house, destroying the siding. I also see that they'd effed up every exterior part of the house to try and pin their misdeeds on me. Months go by, I hear nothing, my lawyer hears nothing, despite multiple tries to contact Slumlord. At this point, I'm filled with an overwhelming sense of joy as I stuck it to that loser. But wait, there's more! I was telling this story to a buddy of mine at work one day, and he knew exactly what house I was talking about. His dad is the county building inspector, and he was telling me about how his dad had stated that the property was so damaged that the house was to be condemned. All I'm left thinking about is, what did he do to that effing place to condemn it after I moved out? Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.